as a data scientist, I literally spend my day predicting the future. I try and model systems and businesses, and I use really cool tools like artificial intelligence or, or blockchain to, to help understand what makes humans tick. And what I found most fascinating from the past few years of my experience, and what's also been the most frustrating, is that all those expressions and all those cliches are true. It bothers me, I don't know why. The fact that the journey is more important than the destination, the fact that to go further and look further, you stand on the shoulders of giants, that those who don't understand what history was are doomed to repeat it. In The Tempest, William Shakespeare wrote that what's past is prologue. I think a lot of people recognize this expression to mean that everything that happened before was exposition, that to live in the present is what's important. Data has shown me that that's different. To me, what's past as prologue means is that the future can be based on a barometer of the past and to understand the trends and signals and patterns of where we've been can show us what we've done before and where we're going to go. This presentation is an argument for basic income. And let me show you how I get there. I start in 1696 in Britain as part of the glass tax. In an effort to raise revenue, the British Parliament created a prohibitive tax on glass and window panes and the like. It meant that glass and windows was so expensive that literally lords and ladies would take glass out of their houses and bring them up to their summer castles for fear of theft or breaking. If you were just a person living in the city, you lived most of your internal life in darkness. It affected things that people had never considered before in different ways. Architecture, interior design. Your dining room didn't have a table in the middle of it. You'd hit your shins in the darkness. People had a, a bench by the side of the room and a large board up against the wall. When it was time to have a meeting or have a meal together, they would take the benches, sit everyone down, bring the board on everyone's lap. That's where they had their meeting. That's where I had the discussion. And that's where we got the term board meeting. Not only that, that guy at the end, that guy in the chair, he was in charge, he ran the show. That's right, that guy was the chairman of the board. <laughs> to me, it is fascinating how arbitrary choices from the past can affect the future centuries later in ways people can't understand or think about at all. And we are coming to one of those critical junctures and choice points again soon. I'm gonna skip ahead a couple decades to the British countryside. The Church of England, in an attempt to reorganize themselves, split up the country into various plots and created parsonages. Each one of these sections had a reverend, and his job was to help guide the flock and all the things that reverends do. These people were given a strong education, they were given enough resources to understand where their next meal was coming from, and they were sent on their way. This was arguably one of the first times a society was, had a class of people who were academic, well-read, and didn't really have that much to do. What did these reverends do? They changed the world. The Reverend Edmund Cartwright created the power loom and brought apart the Industrial Revolution as we know it today. Automation, improving in process, happened because of that. The Reverend John Mackenzie Bacon was the father of modern aerial photography. He showed us the first pictures of cities from above, it revolutionized urban planning and city design. The Reverend William Buckland wrote the essay on the principle of population. You know this already, what he learned back then. Cities only grow when there's an excess of food more than is needed to sustain the population. The Reverend William Greenwell was the father of modern archaeology. Before him, people would just go to dig sites and, and grab stuff because it looked cool and brought it home. He was one of the first people to suggest that we apply proper scientific rigor and scientific method and revolutionized the field of archaeology. It wasn't just the reverends, too, it was their families, their children, their spouses. When people knew that there was a roof over their head and a meal coming to not worry about, their creativity flourished. I bet you know at least half a dozen names on this list of people who were either children or spouses of these reverends. Hook, Wren, Bronte, Tennyson, Carol, Jane Austen. These people were so profound in their ability to push art and science further that even centuries later, we still consume their art in ways that affects us that have never been considered before. We as a society, we as a culture, push further and go farther when we take the tools that have been built before us and go to the next obvious step. Because those expressions are true, those cliches are all true. 
Most people thought it was actually Isaac Newton who said it, but it was actually Bernard de Chartres who said, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. The fact that every time that we want to try push culture further and make society go that little bit farther, that we don't need to go back to the beginning is because we use the tools and processes of people who were built before us. And that's how we advance as a society and as a people. It has never been easier to try and push these ideas ahead and move forward. The ability to take this thing over here and combine it with that thing over there and produce something new has never been easier faster, less expensive, or less involving risk than it is right now. I can't guarantee that the idea of combining this thing and that thing will work, but you'll know quickly if it's going to fail or if it has legs. Never was that way before. Technology usually got in the way more than it helped. This is special. Back then, it was a problem. Example number one, let's talk about audio recording. The ability to take a song or music and record it to a wax disc was incredibly difficult. And if someone made a mistake, if a microphone screwed up, or if someone dropped something on the ground, you had to throw it away and start all over again. Oh, you're already on hour two? Sorry, doesn't care. Start all over. In fact, the audio engineers, too, they had a huge problem. Let's say you're recording a, a symphony in a concert hall. Let's say if the sound got all screwed up, you can't have a violin and a clarinet near each other and next to the tuba, tuba would be too loud. The hack from the sound engineers was to actually move the instruments around the entire theater. So you'd have the, the flutes nearby, you'd have the, the tubas in the background, the drums, the drums were so loud, they actually were down the hall, down the stairs in a separate room. And they had to create a series of mirrors so the drummers can see the conductor to know when to play. If you were a soloist, you were pushed on a little dolly. And when it was your turn, they'd, they'd push you up to the front, right near the microphone to hear it. When you were done, they'd pull you right back again. And if any time in any one of those songs, if someone, if one person made a mistake, you threw it out and you started again. You didn't take risks. You didn't have the time. You didn't have the opportunity. Now if I want to try something new, if I want to see what it sounds like when a guitar gets loud, I just press the guitar knob and turn it up a little bit. Never before have we had the ability for technology to make our life easier and push our creative drive further than we have right now. But it wasn't always like that. It was difficult. If you go back to the war, the fact that planes were coming overhead as part of a bombing run was a huge problem. Before radar, people didn't really have good solutions as to solve to figure out when the planes were coming. Planes are high, planes are fast, planes are far away. We took the best people in the Allied resource. We took the entire knowledge of what we have to do to figure out how to find planes, and we came up with this. Giant earphone-like tubes. <laughs> and a soldier who's hopefully really good at hearing stuff. <laughs> Listening, hoping to hear their propellers. Stretching, yearning, going that little bit further just to hear, to buy an extra minute or two so people can run down to safety. We don't have this problem anymore. Radar is basically a solved problem in many respects. I can go to the store and for a couple bucks buy a little radar in a box. I can put it in my car, I can put it on my bike, I can put it in my hat and do a lot of cool stuff if I wanted to. It has never been easier to give it a chance and see if it works. Will that idea work? I got no clue, but I'll know quickly if I can move on and try something else. It wasn't always like that. Technology often got in the way. You ever wonder why people in old photos don't smile? Yeah, I see some nodding heads. I'm going to be embarrassed about this. When I was a kid, I literally thought that everyone born pre-1920 was just miserable and sad and surly. <laughs> Turns out this was a technical problem. To actually exist and have a camera take a picture back then required a huge amount of light. It required a huge amount of time to sit there and let the light expose the film. So if you're going to take a photo of someone moving, it's going to screw up. So when they say, don't move, you don't move. Because you know if you move, you're going to ruin the photo, and then you've got to start again. This was a huge technical problem at the time, and that's why people were told to not keep their, rest, their smiling face, because I don't know about you, but smiling for a minute starts to look insincere. <laughs> so instead they said, use your resting face, and if you don't have a nice looking resting face, sorry, that's the photo that you get. It's not like that anymore, right? We've solved a lot of these technical problems. Most people have a camera in their own pocket. 
I take a thousand photos, I pick the best three that I like, and I throw the rest away. And I don't need to know about focus and aperture and all these types of technical terms to take a fairly good photo. Technology has made it so that creativity can push us further than we have before. If you want to build different tools, if you want to bring these things together, it's super easy. Machine learning too, if you want to take some cool new AI things and, and move to the next step and go forward, it's fine. You want to take yourself a, a chat bot or recognize emotional detection or look at text or videos and see what's going on it, you can do it for fractions of a penny. I just tried this last night. I built something for this presentation. I went online and I didn't write a single bit of code and I can make something that looked in my face. It can tell if I'm smiling, it can tell if I'm yawning or not, it can tell when I'm blinking, all without writing a single bit of code. If you have an idea where you're taking this piece and this piece and mashing them together, you can do it now easier and faster than ever before. Let's say you want to build a, a camera tool thingy job that if someone takes a picture of someone blinking, it deletes the photo automatically. Well, you don't need to know how cameras work. You just take the camera thing someone built. You don't need to know how neural networks recognize if you're blinking. You just go grab that software and put it together. Could you go to market with that idea? Probably not. But you'll know right away if you've built something that has required you to actually know if have momentum or not. Whether or not you then call in an expert to make it world class. These are the opportunities we have now to go further and push harder. How good are these tools? They're incredible. Just last year, Microsoft released a tool for real-time language translation. So picture those guys at the UN with the little earphones talking in real time really quietly. Average human error rate for that is about 6%. That's that little dot over there in the corner. Machines are now as good at humans at translating language in real time, at scale, 24-7. Just so you think I'm not throwing you a red herring, let's talk about image classification. The problem of taking a photo or video and identifying all the things in it is actually surprisingly hard. Humans will get it right only about 93 times out of 100. Error about 7%. Just last year, Microsoft released a tool, machine learning thing with AI, that's down to 3.5%. As of right now, machines are twice as good at humans at identifying images and objects and videos and pictures. IBM beat them too. They're down to three, three points this year. Not only that, look at that chart. That's a 10 times drop in error in only five years. I can't wait to see what the next five years brings us. Now, there's two schools of thought here. Yes, automation is coming. Yes, a lot of jobs will be made redundant. Now, the first school of thought says, well, Jim, I don't churn my own butter already anyways. You're not wrong, right? The, the progress of progress goes forward and pushes us further than we've been before. The second school of thought argues that that's true, but is a most fortunate opportunity that we have as a people to be able to look in advance and recognize that massive change is coming. Almost never before have a people looked in advance and said, that's coming, we can have a discussion about what we want to do. We can have a debate and a cultured conversation about what happens when lots of people don't have their jobs anymore. I would suggest that for these people, if we give them an education, if we give them enough income to make sure that they have a roof over their head, and if they have enough food on the table, that we can create a class of people who are academic, well-read, and really don't have that much to do. We've seen before in history that these people can change the world in ways that are still affecting us centuries from now. This is the opportunity we have, and this is the discussion that we need to have in the next five years, 10 years, maybe 20. It has never been easier for us to take this thing and that thing and mash it together and try a new idea to see if it has legs. Let me show you, let me give you a very quick example. This is a sphere. Anyone seen a sphere before? It's a fun little toy. I got one for my kid for Christmas. It lets you actually use your phone and connect things together and play. I got one right here. It's a cute little toy, totally made for kids for Christmas. And it's great because it lets my kids learn how to code without them even knowing that they're learning how to code. So here's what I'm going to do. Without writing any code at all, what I'm going to do is take a picture of my face with my cell phone. I'm then going to connect it to a world-class Microsoft deep learning network to look at my face. We're going to tell if it knows if I'm smiling or not. I'm going to change the color of this device based on whether or not I'm smiling or frowning. Remember we talked about pictures and smiling? Let's see how this works. 
Okay, there we go. There we go. And there we go, yellow. Woohoo! Now, the important part I want to get across to you is that I did this writing ridiculously small amounts of code. Someone already built the tool that connects to the cloud. Someone already built the world-class network up there that can look at someone's face, recognize their age, their gender, and if they're smiling for fractions of a penny. Someone out there was kind enough to take this little Sphero tool and build a library that I can connect right into it and not worry about all the stuff about it. But in the abstract, think about what I just did there. For fractions of a penny and maybe a day's worth of my time, I connected to a world-class deep learning network that recognized my face. I then used it to change a wireless IoT device using Bluetooth, just like that. It has never been easier for us to take tools, to take toys, to play with them, to see what idea comes further, to see how we can push ourselves further. I look forward to the next five years because I can't see what's coming. And I look forward to hearing from each and every one of you who has a brilliant idea to take this thing over here and that thing over there and combine them together and to push us as a people further. Thank you very much.